Ladies and gentlemen, as we open the curtain for this afternoon's class discussion, you will be learning another interesting topic which will talk about the literary historical development of Indonesia. As a general rule, we all know that literature is simply defined as the great reflection of our lives as a human, which of course reveals our culture, the beliefs, and the historical beginning of a particular community just like the Philippines. And this time we'll be talking about the country Indonesia, which in fact, this artistic creation can be expressed either in written or in oral forms together with its distinguished characteristics. Of course, when we say characteristics, we are talking literally about its context. Literature plays indeed a vital part in documenting the dramatic success of every nation. Just like, for example, in the country Indonesia, the flourishing of its literary artifacts had something to do with its geographical location. That is in the truth. So this time, allow me to present some information about Indonesian history so that you will be able to see the dots connecting the reasons behind the development of Indonesian literature. Now, when you look at your monitor, if you will just gonna focus on your monitor, you can see there the summarized version of these facts. Okay, you can see there that Indonesia is also called as Republic Indonesia or Republic of Indonesia in English. Knowingly, Indonesia being a country located off the coast of mainland in Southeast Asia, which can be found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, is also known to be an archipelago, just like the Philippines. However, the only difference between the Indonesia and Philippines is that Philippines does not lie across the equator, which spans a distance. Indonesia, on the other hand, it glides across the equator and it spans a distance equivalent to one eighth of Earth's circumference, making the country rank as the fourth of the most populous country around the world. Technically, it is according to the worlddemeter.com that Indonesia comprises 17,508 islands. Yes, 17,500 islands with 33 provinces and approximately consisting of over 276 millions of residents. See? So it's very dense. It's very populated. All right. So aside from Indonesia's remarkable overpopulation status, a website known as Facts About Asia.com also gathers some significant details revealing revealing the complexity or diversity of the Indonesian culture. And it was also accounted that Jakarta, being Indonesia's capital city, becomes the booming center of trade, culture, and politics that, of course, attracts various or several migrants across the Indonesian archipelago, making the place or making the nation as a melting pot of many cultures. Basically, that is why Indonesia, if you are gonna go there, if you are gonna search the country Indonesia, all the information that you can see there, it will really leads you to conclude that Indonesia is a nation that comprises a mixture of races. Well, somehow, similar also to Philippines, right? And this is brought by colonization and also trading why well this is the reason indonesia's central location and the trading routes between the far east and the middle east resulted a strong influence to the proliferation to the flourishing of cultural practices so that's what i mean and number one Number one part of Indonesian culture, it also shows the influences by these invaders 
in the aspect of religion. That is why if you look at on the right side, you can see there various religious affiliation that is present in the country Indonesia as of 2010. So you can see there the purple, which is the highest, the highest, um, yes, the highest illustrate, the highest number of percentage belongs to the Muslim. So next to the Muslim, we also have the others, others representing the religion such as Protestants. So Roman Catholic got only 2.9% and the very least goes to Hindu. So 1.7%. You see, it is really diverse, right? It's complex. Confuci Confucianism, the Islam and Christianity, which entirely different from the original indigenous culture. Of course, right? Now, a concrete example of this is the cultural fusion of Islam with Hindu in Java, in Javanese Abangan belief. There's also a fusion of Hinduism and Buddhism. And there's also a fusion of Hinduism and animism. And they call this Kaharingan. The place is in Kaharingan. So you can see there the fusion of this culture. You can, you can really embrace the combination of two religious affiliation. So Indonesian culture also took pride on its clothes, on its entertainment. So when we talk about the clothes, they also took part on its colorful batik. Okay, if you can see women when they go to any festival or maybe an occasion, yes, gathering, special gathering, you can really see the colorful batik. So the more it is colorful, that means the more um, higher, uh, the more higher, the more, what they call this one, respect, or it, it symbolizes their wealth. If you have the, this very beautiful and grand colorful designs of batik, that means you are wealthy. So that's how they actually indicate the, the status, the position of uh, women and men in the society through their, you know, their, the way how they, they wear their clothes and the design. Okay, they also have this very famous dance, which is the gamilan. And architect, architecture and martial sports called the pinkak silat. Okay, so see, they have also this a very unique culture, just like the Philippines. I think most of the time we are comparing our country, Philippines, to uh, Indonesia, to Malay, right? Because we also have a history that these people, this uh, set of traders really uh, came to our country many decades ago, okay? So, indeed, it's very true to say that uh, Philippines and Indonesia have tremendous similarities, being marked as a diverse culture, sprung from major breakthroughs of World War II. Not only that, Indonesia is also unique because they also have this national motto, which means unity and diversity. And if we are going to use their exact language, they were going to call this motto as Binika Tunggal Ika. Okay, so that means uni unity and diversity. Or, if we are going to translate it literally, word by word, the Binika Tunggal Ika means many yet one. Alright, so I think it's very clear. So, speaking of literal translation of Indonesian language to other non-English language does not have an exact word count if being converted word by word using the English medium. So, that's the difference. Alright, so now let's continue. In the course of Indonesia's economic st stages around the world, it is progressing. Though, at the moment, its currency has a low equivalent in the global market compared to the Philippines' currency rate as per advice from the banks, noticeably 1 rupiah. Imagine 1 rupiah is equivalent to 0 0.0035. 
Okay, so from rupiah, from one rupiah or one rupee to Philippine peso. But if we are going to talk about the US dollar, so the rupiah must have 14,270.50 rupees is equal is equivalent to one US dollar. So we can really conclude that Indonesia is really a poor country. Well, poorer than the Philippines, okay? Mind you that. Anyways, as of, that is according to, okay, the current exchange rate in the stocks market. I researched this information two days ago just to keep an update. Especially right now, we are facing in a very alarming pandemic because we've been causing for almost two years right of the struggle that we have right now everything is being affected the same also in the country indonesia they've been affected by this pandemic everything economy education and so many others okay now fyi the term rupia or rupee is derived from the sanskrit word for silver Rupiakam. Okay, so from the word silver rupiakam, they uh, change it into rupia because it's easier to to enunciate. It's easier to remember also. Now, if you notice, if you have to research about the Indonesian currency rate, you can see there the word Indonesian rupia. There's also their um, Indian rupees, something like that. So you have to be very also careful to to use it. There there is actually a distinction between the two. Well, just like uh, just like the other nation, just like the the euro, the UK, they have also diverse um, currency rate. Right, I think just like also in in Southeast Asian countries. But there are, you know, instances that Indonesians sometimes, well, use the word pirak. Yes, for some commoners, they will use the word pirak compared to the word rupia. This is, well, because pirak, this is referring to rupia in coins. And maybe because the reason why uh, most of the time, they will gonna use the word pirak because there are a lot of people who are suffering in Indonesia. There are a lot of pe people who are also for poor, so uh, we can uh, conclude that they cannot uh, they cannot get higher okay higher higher amount of money, so they don't have the rupiah. So they will just use the pirak because they have a lot of coins literally so maybe that's why they are very used to of using the word pira compared to rupiah okay because indonesians underwent similar fate just like the filipinos in terms of colonization in terms of struggling for independence in terms of poor economic progression so it cannot be denied yes it cannot be denied that the aftermath of the war causes an impactful change in their lives and this is very true because you can see that there is a shared identity there is a diversity and there's a presence of visions of culture cultural practices within the the community in the indonesian community so this shared identity is actually defined by a national language ethnic diversity the religious pluralism within a majority of muslim citizens so it is really true that in indonesia there are a lot of muslims there are a lot of um people there are a lot of uh, people believing in in such religious affiliation in such uh, ethnicity so this diversity of culture is also reflective of the country's multi-party republic so philippines also have its own governance so in indonesia they have this 
multi-party republic with two legislative houses just like also in the philippines we have legislative houses we have the lower house the upper house but they have but the in in part of in behalf of the indonesian country they have this legislative houses called as the regional representative council and the house of representatives so these are the two legislative houses okay so you see the country indonesia has a very rich culture very complex yet it symbolizes unity at the same time of the people who are living in that peaceful country well i will say peaceful because even though they are very overpopulated they still manage to to live as is there is no prevailing so much uh, news about war or conflict unlike the afghanistan the iraq and many other warring states or cities in the whole world so they have this lilo issue when it comes to warfare okay anyways Aside from that, um, Indonesia's challenging political buttons, its colorful practices, are being strongly influenced by multitude of religious affiliations, just like what I've said earlier, including by the Western culture in terms of, yes, the Protestants. And there are also other factor that we can see that Indonesia is also a country that never allow themselves to be being out uh, outdated yes being outdated so they keep up with the gadgets with the technology so that's why there are also mother entertainment in Indonesia so despite the influences of foreign culture some remote Indonesian regions also value in preserving their unique ethnic groups and what are these indonesian ethnic groups they are the mantawi mintawi they are the asmat the dani dayak turaha and many others who are still practicing their ethnic rituals customs and wearing of traditional clothes so if you can also remember in our country in the philippines it's also somehow similar when it comes to preservation of the ethnic or the ethnicity or the native culture, the customs, the traditions. And I'm talking about this, the, um, the Banubu, Bagubu, the Manubus. And they're also part of like, what else? There are a lot of tribes in, 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 in the Philippines that uh even until this time they're also protecting and preserving their ethnic culture their tribe amidst the modernity of the world so somehow i would say that we are also similar to the country indonesia although there are also some preferences and other differences but as one as a part of the southeast asian nation it is more of the major similarities can really be looked after in the indonesian and philippines there is oh there is always this tie up of the culture there's always this the uh, more of similarities compared of the difference of the different differences yes in general okay now uh, this time let us try to look at the what we call as the geographical location of the country indonesia because i keep on talking about the number of provinces the number of islands yes so it's about time that i will present to you where is indonesia located in the map so we cannot travel right now i cannot take you to indonesia per se i cannot lend you my magic airplane but this time i will gonna show it to you the map that will lead you to the country indonesia can you see can you spot there where is indonesia 
Okay, so I'm going to use my pen here. So this is Indonesia. And if you can notice, there are places or dots or part of the regions that are colored. So I don't know what's the color of this exactly because the picture is not too clear for me. I think this is beige or something like brownish. So yes, I am putting some circles in here so that you will be identified easily what are these regions. So these are the parts of the Indonesian territory. Okay, so I mentioned about the Indonesian Ocean. Okay, this is the Indonesian Ocean and we're uh, okay looking for the Pacific Ocean. Yes, this is also the Pacific Ocean. So basically, we can really find Indonesia. And where is Philippines? Oh, Philippines is next to Indonesia. That is why we are also closer to the country Indonesia. And most of our uh, native tribes way back decades ago were also taken from their culture. Mm, just like the Malayo Polynesian, so the Malaysia. See? These are the triads. Okay, the three neighboring countries okay so see it's very beautiful to study the indonesian history now this time my dear friends it's about time that i will unlock yes unlock the virtual floor to the literary development of the country indonesia what does it look like how does literary um, or how does literature flourished or developed in the country Indonesia? Do they have the same movement just like ours in the Philippines? Or this time they have quite different type of, you know, um, development. So, on the next slide, I'm going to show it to you. Okay. Oops, I remember that there is still one slide left before I will proceed to the literary development of Indonesia or the Indonesian literature's literary development. So allow me to give this quick facts about Indonesia because someday if you have the plans to go outside the country, if the pandemic will be over, maybe you can visit Indonesia one of these days or one of these months and you will stumble these beautiful landmarks. So let's start with Mount Bromo okay, and Mount Semero. So we have two active volcanoes in Eastern Java, Indonesia. So this is the picture that I took from Britannica.com. So there are two volcanoes and remember Philippines is also known for their perfect volcanoes, the Mayan volcano, and also we have the Taal volcano. So, just like Indonesia, they also have theirs, the Mount Brahma, this is the foreground, and the Mount Semero, the background. Okay, so let me use my pen. So, this is the Mount Semero, and this is the Mount Bromo, okay. We also have the Mount Agong Volcano overlooking rice paddies in northeastern Bali, Indonesia. Okay, it looks so beautiful and, you know, very like, very like the Philippines. Yeah, okay, you see there it's the volcano with the rice field. So, remember, we also have our rice field, the Banawi rice terraces, okay? So, we also have what we call as the richness in biodiversity in Indonesia. So, you can see there, uh, German, yes, marine or scientists. And we also have the Pura Ulun, a Hindu temple in the bank of Lake Bratan, Bali, Indonesia. So they have a lot of temples actually. Another temple is the Great Mosque in Palimbang, South Sumatra, Indonesia. 
and we have also the stupas at Borobudur, Central Java, Indonesia. So I have seen there. I have seen this uh, picture most of the time from travel bloggers. They really love to visit the Borobudur and to see the very unique bell um, bell shape mosque. Okay. We also have here the type of houses. So this is the typical rural housing in Bogor district, Java, Indonesia. So another one is the very temporary housing in Atoraha village, constructed for guests and relatives attending a funeral on the island of Celebes, the Sulawesi, Sea, Indonesia. Farming is also one of the major occupation of the people in Indonesia. So you can see there a farmer tilling the land in the lower right. So yes, he is tending the terrace rice paddies and the place is in Bali, Indonesia, based on the source provided by David Austin, Austin from, from Stone. Okay. Not only that, we also have the eating habit in Indonesian country. So they cannot live without this. This is the must dinner. So we can really see there the pork. Yes, the, the presence of the pork, the chicken, the noodles. Okay, later on, I will also uh, tell you about the, the name of this food as we go along. Okay. So, we have also the desserts, okay, we have sushi, the Indonesian type of sushi, kind of cookies, the fruits, and of course, durian in Indonesia, we have like this in the Philippines. So, they are so sweet, the durians are very sweet in, not in Indonesia, okay, because I'm not sure i haven't tried the indonesian durian but i remember the durian in davao because i went to davao eight years ago and the first uh, fruit that i tasted was the durian so i fell in love with the durian fruit compared to the jackfruit in Cebu. anyways okay so this is the quick facts about indonesia and i hope that you seem to be interested to visit the country indonesia and remember, talking about the money, so uh, as a travel, as a wise traveler, so Indonesia is a good spot to travel and to, to unwind and to dine because they have uh, lesser, you know, they're ch they have cheaper or affordable prices when it comes to food and travel expenses. Okay, so we are done with the quick facts about Indonesia. This time, it is really the literary development so we will be talking more about the developments of literature in indonesia and i hope that i will not find you uh be, I, I hope that you will not get bored of the information that i'll be presenting because it's really huge for me but i will make it quicker so that we can also grasp the we can also grasp the summary of my presentation okay so let's jump into the literary history the development of literature in indonesia okay here we go to the literary historical development of the country indonesia so one by one i will call out the names of these group or period the first period that really strike me the most is what we call as the period of Hindu Buddha. So later on, I will talk about the different characteristics in each period. But let me call out the names of the periods first. We also have the next period called the period of Islamic Empire, followed by the Bujanga Lama, or literates of olden times. Next, we have the Sastra Milayu Lama, the older Malay literature, followed by Angkatan Balai Pustaka, the generation of the popular 
Literature, Proceeding to Angkatan Pujangga Baru, The New Literates, followed by Angkatan 1945. So this is generation of 1945 or the period of 1945, succeeded by the Okay, Angkatan 1950 or the generation of 1950s followed by the 1960s and Angkatan 1980 or the decade of the 1980s. Angkatan Reformacy, this is called the Reformation Period in English. We also have the Angkatan 2000 generation of 2000s or a generation of the millennium okay so followed by the postmodern generation so these are the literary historical development and each one of the period here that i am presenting or showcasing has its own characteristics so let's try to study briefly what does each period resembles? Okay, are you ready? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. The first wave of literary development in the Indonesian literature started with the period of Indubuddha. This period is being characterized as the discovery of Yupa inscription that written records found in the 4th century. At that time, the writing adopted the Sanskrit and Palawa letters from India. At the same time, the poets, yes, the poets at the time began to develop their skills and literature. That is why it's so difficult to find the relic of the famous writers during the time, but I'm so lucky that I was able to pull up the copies of the old books, the old uh, collections that this period was able to document. So what are these collection of books? So we have here the Bharata Yuga. It's an epic book, of course. We also have the Arjuna Wiwaha book and the Sotasuma book. So notable writers during this, this time or this period are Pusida, uh, Mpu Panulu, Pu Kanwa, and Pu Prapanka. So we also have the last one, Pu, Pan, uh, Pu Tantular. So these are the famous writers during the period of Hindu Buddha. The next period is the period of Islamic empire. So what is the period of Islamic empire talks about. So it talks about stories, the circulation of stories that relates to the stories of the Prophet Muhammad, Sunan, Wali, or other saint of Islamic people. So basically it's more of a reflection of the religious affiliation during this period of Islamic empire. From the word itself, Islamic empire. So the building of the Islam. So who are the uh, writers, notable writers, and the literary pieces during this period? So you can see there, Sunan Bunang. He is a famous writer during the period of Islamic Empire, and his work is Soluk Wujil. So Soluk Wujil, according to my research, is actually a good example of early Javanese Islamic literary work that features spiritual quest and teaching. So the character, the main character, Solok Wujil, is a convert, a person who is converted, who wanted to teach or who wanted to reach the essence of the ultimate truth. Wujil is a symbolical figure carrying an important uh, teaching as well as the revealing of social religious discourse in the early development of Islam in Java. So you can see the transition from the period of Hindu Buddha, it goes to the period of Islamic empire. So later on, I will ask you what is that transition that you have observed? What is the major characteristic that you have observed from these periods? Next period is the 
okay pujanga lama or the old poets so the pujanga lama is the eldest generation in indonesian literature history and contains most of literature that was adapted from malay literature because of indonesian um Indonesia, because Indonesia has some root with, with the Malay, and the connection of their culture between these two nations were great way back then. So this period is being characterized by the popularity in the production of poems. So that's why it's called Literates of Olden Times. It's a collection of uh, traditional stories in narrative forms. So there is also the um, the four line with rhymes, we also have the collection of stories or fables. So, by the way, let me uh, repeat that when we say traditional stories in narrative forms in English literature, we equate this as short stories. But in Indonesia, this is what we call as traditional stories in narrative forms or siaer. So, they call it siaer. And the poetic, the poetic part, the poems, collection of poems, they also use um, the word panton in Indonesian language. So for them, a poem is called as panton. And when you say fables or stories of um, anim stories where animals are the main characters, so they call this in Indonesian language as hikayat. We also have the word babad. So babad in Indonesian language, but in English it is chronicles. So in English, yeah, chronicles more of like um, it's a series. Yes. Okay. So who is this famous writer during the Pujanga Lama period? So Pujanga Lama period's famous writer is. Hamza Fansuri. Actually, there are a lot of notable writers. However, I selected him because I can easily find his book, the copy of his book, and also um, some of the informations that I am able to share today. So, Sia uh, Sidam Fakir. So, this is a collection, this is a famous work. Of Hamza Fansuri and this is you know um, a very unique type of literary work because Hamza Fansuri is using a mixture of Arabic and Indonesian language so he described the fields of meaning of being in master of the words so he uses a lot of words that are included in the category of being where the words are related to abstract human concepts or experiences and he uses these Arabic words such as fakir, makbab, saber, daim. So Hamza Fansuri is a great uh, player of words. So he believed the cons that he believed that uh, the essence of uh, the existence of your words, the being, is connected with the abstract human concepts or experiences. So, what does it mean? Uh, your experiences, your uh, human emotions, your human ideals must be um, characterized by the words that you use. So, for example, you, you feel angry, so you have to use a word uh, that is negative or um, it describes a bad emotion. So that's according to him that the field of meaning of being in the master of words. That's according to Hamza Fansuri's principle. Okay, so next is we have the Angkatan Balai Pustaka or the generation of the popular literature. So Angkatan Balai Pustaka, this period falls somewhere or sometime in the sometime on the year 1920 to 1950 and the period is dominated by the Dutch East Indies colonial government 
when they took over and arranged the literature circulation. So they controlled the production of the literary works during the Angkatan Balay Pustaka or the generation of the popular literature. So the results of work of this literature are mostly romances and novels. And one of the famous great writers during the period is Mara Russell, and he wrote The City Nurbaya. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot see the exact manuscript of City Nurbaya, so I'll just leave it as it is. I don't know if, what's the story all about, but I just have to present the, the, the book, City Nurbaya, because that's the only book that I can find in the internet that has a cover. Okay, so these are the first four literary periods in the Indonesian literature. So you can see already the transition starting from the period of Indo Buddha down to the Angkatan Balai Pustaka or the generation of the popular literature. So if you can notice, starting from the period of Indo Buddha, it is followed by the Islamic Empire. So you can see that based on these four periods, the reflection of the, ref, um, the presence of the foreign, um, foreign writings are also being shown or being used in this period. And the play or the significance of religion is also taken into consideration. Uh, if you notice, during the period of Islamic empire, Islam is being highlighted. And during also the time of Pujang Dalama, Arabic um, language is also being highlighted. And the time of Angkatan Balai Pustaka, or the generation of the popular literature, uh, okay, uh, the colonization of the Dutchess, or the Dutch and the East Indies, uh, putting right or control of the production of the literary circulation. See? So these are the major things that happen in the four periods of literary um, Indonesian history or development. So let's proceed to the next period. The fifth period in the Indonesian literature talks about the old Malay generation or Sastra Melayu Lama. This generation were developed on the year 1870 until 1942 and were reflection from the old societies in classic Malay culture. The old Malay or classic literature had characteristic and the following are, it is more of oral or unwritten that grew with the power of audience or the people itself. It tends to be static, not having improvement in quantity. And most of the writers are held anonymous. It's centered subject about palace or kingdom. It uses cliche languages that tend to be monotone and static. And lastly, it is influenced by the Arabian culture, Muslim and Indian. So one of the famous works of the Sastra Milayo period is the Saga of Siti Maria and it is written by Haji Mukti. There's also another one by FDJ Pangimanan Sijunat. Okay, let's proceed to the next period. Okay, the next period is the Angkatan 1945 or the generation of 1945. The essence of this literature or literary works are mostly inspired by the socio-political circumstances of the revolution in order to maintain independence. And the many works of literature here produced are in the form of poetry. And that poetry is also reflective of the spirit of nationalism. One of the famous writers of this period is Pramodja Anantatuwer. And I was able to pull up his work. This is 
entitled The House of Glass. It's a novel. Okay, the next period, the seventh period is what we call as the Angkatan Pujanga Baru or the New Literates. So for the Angkatan uh, Pujanga Baru, it is actually in the year 1930 to 1942, 1950s. The Pujanga Baru is a form of reaction from Balai Pustaka publishers who are considered too strict in censorship, especially on works that contain elements of nationalism. So I remember in our country, Philippines, the time of Dr. Jose Rizal, wherein during the time censorship is also very, very strong. The Spanish uh, regime controlled the production of the works of Dr. Jose Rizal because the government, the Spanish government knew for the fact that Dr. Jose Rizal is revolting against them. He uses or he used his writing, his talent to uh, revolt against the Spanish regime. So that's why censorship is very uh, very common during the period. The same also in the period of Angkatan Pujanga Baru. So somehow there is a relationship between the two. They talk about nationalism. Hmm. Okay, so independence is very common also. The, the Philippines and Indonesia, they're struggling for, uh, for acquiring uh, independence, total independence, absolute freedom from the foreign invaders. Okay, next we have also uh, the period called Angkata 1950s, the generation of 1950s, and uh, one of the famous work is the the work uh, written by N. H. Dini. So the Amaku Hiroko. So it sounds like Japanese. Okay, so these are the second set of periods from the period Sastra Milayo Lama down to the Angkatan 1950s. During the 1950s to 1960s, uh, the publication, uh, the production of literary works are actually trying to flourish because they already, they already moved to the censorship issue, so it's already been resolved. However, there is still, uh, there is still a lot of um, inhibitions to write great uh, literary writings, writings that uh, go beyond the topic about nationalism. So we have the fifth, the sixth, seventh, and the eighth periods already. So on the next slide, let's have the following periods. The next period covers the Angkata 1966 to 1970s. So this is the generation of the 1960s to 70s. This period is marked by the publication of Horizon Literary Magazine. And in that magazine, the literary works are published with a very tight selection, so there was a stiff competition among the literary authors of Indonesia when it comes to getting a chance to be published. So some of the people who love to read literature might have subscribed this magazine. In fact, there are various literary styles that were growing during the time. Such style focuses on surrealism and absurdity. One of the famous literary, literary writers is Taufik Ismail, who wrote Tirani Dan Benting. So you can see on his picture giving a speech. So this is his gratitude talk, acknowledging the people of Indonesia who patronizes the Tirani Dan Benting. Okay, so next period is Angkatan 1980 or the decade of the 1980s. So you can see there Margaret T, one also one of the notable writers during this period, and she wrote the novel Carmela. 
Okay, so what the period talks about? So this period talks about the circulation of the romance and love styles of writing. The theme are mostly into romantic, uh, the uh, romantic focus or romantic themes, and they began to appear popular novels with easy to understand light stories using a very simplified language. Okay, so the simplicity of the language is being the trend in writing most of the novel stories during the decade of the 1980s. So another period is the what we call as Ankatan Reformacy or the Reformation period. It falls in 1998. And the reform of state structures in political, social, and economic aspects has given a good chance toward the development of Indonesian literature. There are many new writers with novels, short stories, poems, and essays with various themes. So this is the age wherein new writers are becoming um, experts on their craft they have this um the dire need of experimenting different style of writing so freedom of expression provides creativity in the content of the story one of the notable writers of the period is ayu utami and she was also awarded as one of the best seller um, author in authors one of the bestseller authors in indonesia she wrote saman and another award-winning writer is also rosmini who wrote tarian, Bum tarian bumi now let's proceed to the next period the generation of the millennium or the millennial so this is what we call as the modern period Along with the shift of political power from Suharto's hands to Habebe and the rest, there was also an issue of the emergence of the rise of poetry, short story, and novels, and focusing on the theme of social political, especially around the information around the reformation period so one of the literary writers is andrea hareta uh, andrea hirata okay and he wrote uh, the book the rainbow troops now after the period of generation 2000 there comes the postmodern era this is our time and it comes up to the millennial era the literature in indonesia grows really well and there are many popular writers that the writing made even known in overseas and one of these writers is D.B. Listari, who wrote the supernova and also the trilogy trilogy jendela trilogy jendela and we have also the sikar ayu asmara another writer who wrote the pintu terlalang okay so these are the last waves of notable writers and their works in the country indonesia Okay, again, we have the generation of the 1960s, the decade of the 1980s, the Reformation period, and the contemporary period to the postmodern era. Okay, so I hope you learned a lot of things when it comes to the transition of Indonesian literature. And you can see also what are the different characteristics of each period because I keep on mentioning about the characteristics and also some of the uh, examples of literary pieces, okay? So, on the next slide,
What does an Indonesian literature resemble? The golden age of Indonesian literature, according to many scholars, was the period between the 1950s and 1960s. Authors were working out how to connect traditions and local flavors with modern trends in literature. In that period, the Cold War was raging, and many authors were firstly involved in ideological tug of wars among themselves. Authors also began to seriously search for a distinct Indonesian identity through the works that could become part of the world culture. Unfortunately, that vibrancy had to abruptly end with the takeover of power from Soekarno to Soeharto. After Soeharto stepped down in 1998, there was a brief moment of euphoria among authors as freedom of speech and democratization began to flourish. However, that 32-year authoritarian rule seemed to have thought them not to be too optimistic. And this is clearly reflected in the works of the post soharto writers, which are strongly marked by doubt and ambiguity about the future. In those works, readers may sense a yearning for freedom from the haunting legacy of Suharto's, Suharto's rule. So in comparison to our country, Philippines, we also have this experience of yearning for freedom from the time that we were colonized by Spain, by Japanese, by the Americans, we always yearn for freedom. Even until the time when the Marcus administration set in, we still have this euphoria of going back to the past and tracing our roots and just like the Indonesian is looking for its own identity because we are totally lost. So the writers at the time were also um, confused were um, confused about the ambiguous future that they are um, that they're facing so it is actually a universal experience of Southeast Asian countries which is the yearning for freedom so this is how an Indonesian literature resembles from the time of the Hindu Buddha period until to the until to the the 90s period. So in this postmodern era, the the shift has also been uh, causing a different change, or it tremendously. Uh, shifted in another focus, another attention. Let us focus our attention on various issues and concerns pertaining to the development of Indonesian literature. Now, as I do my research, I have found out these four major questions together with their answers of course. The first question talks about the Indonesian main styles and themes. Okay, so when it comes to the style and theme of Indonesian literature, it has been said that the use of realism and romanticism become the dominant style by the Indonesian authors. Realism, realism because the, these Indonesian authors really wanted to spark, to give a spark to open up the minds of the Indonesian readers about the events, the current events, uh, about the issues in the country. And romanticism because they also have this sense of disillusionment of the past. So somehow they really wanted to, to regain, to get back, to... Um, to feel being romanticized, to just relax themselves from too much pressure, too much problem in the country. So these two themes, realism and romanticism, are the most favorite major themes and style of Indonesian writers. Second question is, what is the state of Indonesian literature when it comes to translation when it comes to worldwide translation the answer to that is indonesian literature is not so much popular when it comes to getting translation from other countries 
So the writings of Indonesian authors do not get translated as much as works by other authors of the third world country or countries just like Philippines. The reason to that is because of colonial legacy that plays a part in this. I remember one of the uh, most influential writer in the year 1945 in, um, in this generation, Pramodia Ananta Tuwer. He is uh, the writer of The House of Glass which became very uh, famous and because of that Pramudia Ananta Tuer received a Nobel Prize award in, in 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 America and I'm not quite I'm not sure whether it is because the work is a great masterpiece or whether because Pramudia Ananta Tuer uh, became a prisoner of war and he wrote his experiences and from that experiences maybe um, the judgment of uh, the the foundation became cloudy you know you know what I mean like it's out of pity or something like that and uh, anyway according to some some critics that Pramudia Anantawar is actually a great writer and also a political activist. Anyway, so let's have the third question. Uh, are there efforts to publish Indonesian literature in translation? So in, on, in their behalf, whether these writers would like to uh, exert too much effort to get some publishers to let their works being translated? The answer to that is... Um, they have meager attention from big international publishers. So, uh, a foundation and a small publishing house in the U.S. are working to bring more English translations of Indonesian literature. But this Lunter Foundation is, based on my research, is the only foundation that really gives the chance to get the uh, the literary works written by Indonesian authors get translated in various languages, especially in English language. So, the American John McGlean has done extraordinary work in doing this kind of translating and publishing Indonesian literature in English. So, somehow, uh, they're very lucky also because there's this one American soul who wanted to reach out and who wanted to help the Indonesian uh, authors. So that's a great point. Next, the last question is, how was the production of literature following the communist purge? So talking about purging, well, we remember that this very cruel uh, ruler named Suharto really gives a very bad reputation of Indonesian literary development because he puts too much effort in controlling in um, disallowing many Indonesian authors to write whether to write their experiences or to write against the, the the government that was ruled by him so the answer to the question is literary production remained consistently high even during the repressive era of Suharto so even during his strictness there are still uh, writers who really wanted to you know to not to waver uh, the love of writing so the repressions did not did not discourage them so in the 1970s and 1980s the works by women authors such as Mera W Marga T these are some of the names La Rose Iki Sepumo Titi Said in H Dini and Marian Katopo dominated the scene when we say dominated the scene, so we can really project that these are the 
these are the powerful women writers during the 1970s and 1980s. So women are very empowered to express themselves, to cut the marginalization, to stop the discrimination of women and such abusive laws against their rights. So they are te technically empowered. But despite of it, many male critics tend to brush them aside as women's fiction and also projecting them a negative connotation of having a low literary quality. So we cannot get rid of the fact that during this period there is the clashing of the, the gender, the men versus the women, and that women are weak and men are strong, that men are better or best and women are just, you know, better compared to them and women are assigned to stay at home while the men are assigned to liberate themselves and to work to be the provider to be the the emblem of uh, the society's uh, uh, what they call this one the the Okay, I'm lost of words. In other words, that there is the clashing of the gender. Okay, so gender inequality is very, um, very transparent, very visible. Okay, so I hope that you understand uh, your our questions and our concerns about the four major issues. Uh, the issues about the dominant style, the issue about getting translation worldwide, and how was the literary uh, translation after the Suharto regime, after the purging of the community, Communist Party. So I hope you were able to get the, the main context of what I'm saying right now. Okay, so now let's proceed to the next slide. A while ago, you learned about the different literary development of Indonesian literature. Now, this time, I am showcasing one sample literary work subjected for our discussion this afternoon. And this piece is entitled Malin Kundang. Malin Kundang is one of the famous book tales in Indonesia and it is very insightful you can learn a lot of lesson although it seems like very uh, childlike however the theme that you can get will really help you in realizing how it is to become a good person okay so the story started like this he was a boy from a very poor family who lived with his mom. So Malin Kundeng's father was a sailor, but he had already died. Malin, on the other hand, was a smart boy. However, apart from his being smart, he also had this attitude that keeps him in trouble. He is a very naughty boy. He always chased a chicken and hit it with a broom. And the one day, he slipped off and hurt himself. The wound left a scar on his hand. When Malin grew up, he decided to go to the city. So one day, he would become rich by the time he went back to the village. So Malin's mother disagreed with this decision because he was the only one she had. But Malin had already made up his mind, and his mother had no other choice but to let her only child go. Malin was traveling by sea, so he came along with one rich merchant. Malin was hoping to become one of his crew and learn from that merchant. He went to any place wherever the wind took him. Soon, he became a great, successful man. Many years have passed since then, 
Malin has become a rich merchant because of his hard work and married the most beautiful girl in the world. And he had forgotten his mother as well as the village. On the other hand, Malin's mother was getting older. She missed her child so much that she had always wait for Malin's return at the harbor every day until one day there was a merchant who stopped by the village. She knew it was Malin at the moment she saw him. What makes her so sure was because of the scar on his hand. But, sadly, Malin denied her as his mother because Malin felt ashamed to his wife and the crew. Then, he left. He was gone. Malin's mother was really upset that she started to curse him. On his journey, Malin's ship began to shake and soon it turned into stone until now. Alright, so let's process the story. What is your takeaway in the story of Malin Kundang? Okay, so we have to consider the three important questions. The first is, what is the major lesson of the story? Now, this is focusing about the theme. So, we need to ask ourselves, what does the writer wants to teach us as a reader? Not only in the folktale Malam Kundang, but generally, when you read any literary work, you also need to consider the presence of the theme or the author's intention of writing such literary work. Because there is no such literary work that will come, well, that will go into waste without the leading of the author, without the guiding of the authors through the presence of the theme. Next question is getting into the character. So, just the character. Malin Kundang's support in generating the story's theme. So we have to observe the character of Malin Kundang. And there are also cues that will tell us what kind of character does Malin Kundang show. And we also have to establish a concrete evidence that the character of Malin Kundang is supporting is generating such support in the story's theme. Next question which pertains to character is, how does the character help in solidifying the author's intention? Okay, so it's very clear. How does the character help? After asking the character's significance, to the development of the theme, we also need to consider the setting. Where and when did the story happen? And does the setting reveal the real Indonesian lifestyle? Does it reflect the reality? So these are the three powerful questions. And if we are able to get our answers, then we can really tell ourselves that we get the idea, we get the purpose, we get the intention of a writer, and the writer succeeded. Because every writer has its own purpose, and the purpose is to tell something to the reader, and that something can ignite a spark, can help, can enlighten. Okay, can enlighten, can inspire the readers. To do more in, in in life so this is the the powerful powerful questions that can help us that can lead us in in solidifying our 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 learning our insights upon reading any fictional narrative okay so it's best to remember that in indonesia Literature may be divided into several generations, and that is influenced by traditions among sailors and traders that had came centuries ago. Therefore, it is 
rightful to say that the geographical features also could not be separate from being one of the major factors in the development of Indonesian literature. Because Indonesia being the largest country with thousands of islands that was once a colony of Dutch in Japan for 100 years, it is very evident, it is very um, correct that we would say the rich culture of Indonesia is the product of those colonizers and how deep it became an impact to Indonesian literature as well, even up to these days. Okay, so I hope you've learned a lot of things about Indonesian culture, the traditions and as well as the different uh, development of literature in Indonesia. Okay, this is for today and once again, this is Maria Delgado presenting to you the development of Indonesian literature. Thank you.